Hello, my name's Catherine. I'm a second year student and a member of Morlands Church. Today's reading is from Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, and I'll give you a moment to find that. But now, a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice, because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, let me add my welcome. Uh, My name is Danny, and uh, it's great to be here, and it's great to be uh, looking at this very important uh, little passage. Uh, So before we do, uh, I'm going to lead us in prayer and ask uh, for God's help. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that there are many distractions and many, many needs in our world, as we've already prayed. But we thank you that Jesus teaches us that our one great need is to hear you speak, to understand, and to believe. And so we ask now for your help, for ears that hear, for hearts that receive your word, so that we might know your great love to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. I want to begin this morning with a warning from a man called Warren Buffett, who is the world's seventh richest person and considered to be one of the most influential and successful investors of all time. Warren Buffett says, it's only when the tide goes out that you realize who's been swimming naked. It's a metaphor, of course, for making sound financial investments, or rather for not making foolish ones and being exposed when the market crashes or the economy fails. Now, I'm neither qualified nor interested in giving you financial advice this morning. Instead, I want to use Warren Buffett's warning to ask you, to think as seriously and soberly and clearly as possible for a few minutes about your ultimate confidence as you face eternity. Because the principle is exactly the same. While we may not like to think about it, the Bible describes a day of judgment, a day that will bring an end to life as we know it that will usher each one of us into our final destiny, either heaven or hell, God's welcome or God's rejection. And that moment is going to be like the tide going out because it's it's going to be a moment of revelation, a moment of inescapable exposure, when the wisdom or foolishness of what we have trusted in in this life will be revealed. And so my question to you this morning is simply this. When that moment of revelation comes, will you be safe or will you be exposed? It's only when the tide goes out that you realize who's been swimming naked. 
Well, we're going to reflect on that question by turning back to the short passage that Catherine read to us from Paul's letter to the Romans. And what I hope to show you as clearly as I can is that there is only one way to prepare for that day safely. And it is to be clothed in the love of God, which is expressed in the cross of Christ. Please notice the crucial second part of that statement. It's not enough to hope in some abstract concept of the love of God. The only safe way to enter eternity is to be clothed in the love of God, which is expressed in the cross of Christ. That is the crucial difference. And it's interesting, if I had James there with his big dictionary to look up the word crucial, it'd be interesting to notice that the word crucial comes, of course, from the word crucifixion, because that is the central truth of the whole Bible. And this is what this passage is about. Uh, well, it'd be good to make sure you've got that passage open. If you've got a free hand, grab an outline as well. Perhaps if you're not holding a cup of coffee or a baby or a cigar or something, I don't know, I can't actually see what any of you are doing, can I? But Bible in one hand, outline in the other would be great. And we're going to look at it under three headings that you'll see on the outline. Why does it matter? Uh, what has God done? And what must I do? Before we do, I might just explain why I'm out of breath. Uh, there's a little vestry door here with a very convenient bathroom for preachers. And about a minute before the time end, I went to uh, visit the bathroom and I found the door was locked. And I can tell you it's a very long way in that minute to run across the courtyard, through the Sunday school, down the stairs, into the toilets and back. And on the way, I dropped my glasses and got them covered in ice. And so that's why I'm a little bit out of breath. And it's a great reminder of uh, why we need to build uh, some more bathrooms and toilets in this, in this place. Well, I've, I've had a chance now to catch my breath. Hopefully you've had a chance to make sure you've got a passage uh, and outline in front of you. And uh, we begin with why does it matter? This is a dense and important little passage. And before we look at some of the details, it's helpful to see that Paul is thinking about two great themes, two of the themes uh, in which, uh, of the letter in which it is found. These two great themes are the character of God and the confidence of the Christian. And the purpose of the passage is really to explain how those two issues connect in the crucifixion of Jesus. The first theme, then, is the character of God. The key phrase Paul uses throughout the passage is the righteousness of God, which can also be translated as the justice of God or the justification of God. Now, we had a wonderful definition of righteousness earlier, didn't we? But have a look at it in the passage, verse 21. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Or verse 25, he did this to demonstrate his justice. Or verse 26, he did it to demonstrate his justice, same word, at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Can you see that Paul's aim is to prove, to demonstrate, to establish the righteousness of God? That at the heart of this universe is a person whose character is fundamentally right and just and trustworthy. Now, why does Paul feel the need to prove that at this point in the letter? Could it be that what Paul has said so far poses a problem for God's character, his righteousness and justice? Well, in a word, yes. And this is because our passage comes at the end of a long and devastating section, which Joe mentioned earlier, which functions like a kind of a court case for the prosecution against mankind. Humanity has been tried. God is the judge. And look again at verse 10 of chapter 3, where Paul begins to conclude that courtroom drama. He says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Just to make sure we are clear, Paul has brought through 118 to 3 verse 10, the whole of the human race into the court of God's justice. And the conclusion, quite frankly, to bring the language up to date, is that we're stuffed. We've had it. We're guilty, and we haven't got a leg to stand on. 
This case began back in 1 verse 18 where he says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men and women who suppress the truth by their wickedness. And it concludes in 19 and 20, every mouth must be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. And in between, he has brought mountains of evidence to prove our guilt and to place at the foot of each man and each woman the fundamental accusation that we have rejected and offended God, that we've lived in his world without serving him, that we've taken his gifts without thanking him, that we've lived in his world without worshipping him or even acknowledging that he is here. So it may have amused us or baffled us to see President Trump make his departure from Washington on Air Force One with I did it my way playing on the speaker system. Did you notice that this week? Among all the other bizarre things that have happened this week, we heard Frank Sinatra singing the President of America away as he left office. But Paul's point in 118 to 320 is that those words, I did it my way, would be a fitting conclusion to every one of our time on earth. We might not fly away in Air Force One, but that is our song, I did it my way, not God's way. And every lie and selfish act that I have done, every good thing I have failed to do, and all the abuse and harm and evil that has washed through human history is traced back to that idolatrous, godless assertion of independence. I did it my way. And so Paul can say in 3 verse 10, there is no one righteous, not even one. And this makes it clear. As Neil reminded us in the prayers earlier, that the greatest problem facing our world The thing we should really fear is not COVID or a crashing economy or crime or climate change, but the fact that a holy and righteous God stands against each of us in his wrath. And verse 19, there is nothing we can do, nothing we can say. There is no excuse, only guilt. And therefore, we have a problem with the character of God at this point in the letter. Paul has established that God has rightly judged us as unrighteous. And so how can he say in verse 21, but now a righteousness from God is available? And go on to say that forgiveness and salvation is freely available. To put this as clearly as I can, How can God be right to say that I am right when he's just said that I am wrong? How can God be right to say that I am right when he's just proved that I am wrong? How can that be just? In fact, this touches the great tension of the character of God that is embedded in the storyline of the whole Bible. That on the one hand, we are told that God is a God of love who created us in his image out of love, to share in his love and generosity in the universe. On the other hand, he is fiercely holy and pure, unable to tolerate sin in any form. And that tension bubbling under the surface throughout the whole of the Old Testament story is going to come to a conclusion in this central passage here. How can God be right to declare us right when he knows that we are wrong? Can his character be trusted? Is God really just? Well, that brings us to the second thing on Paul's mind, which is the confidence of the Christian. You can tell this passage is about confidence if you look down to verse 27, where Paul goes on to talk about what we boast in, what we're proud of. He wants to turn his readers' pride in their own good works and their own keeping of the law into a total confidence in the love of God expressed in the cross of Christ. Now, my wife and I went to Scotland for our honeymoon. 
And as we drove off from our wedding day, we found that my best man and ushers had done a spectacular job of decorating the car, which was my mum's kindly loaned Ford Fiesta. And as we drove away, we realized that they'd really done a very thorough job indeed of, of decorating the car in that traditional way. The back seat was full of balloons. The carpets were full of rice. The air conditioning system was blowing out confetti. There was shaving foam under the handles. There was Vaseline on the steering wheel. There was bangers under the exhaust pipe. And of course, that string of tin cans rattling along behind and a big just married uh, scrawled on the windscreen with lipstick. The car was a total mess. And after a while, when we'd sort of got over the fun of it and quite frankly, wanted to clean it up, we stopped at a service station and we spent some time cleaning the car so we could drive on and get to our destination safely. And we cleaned the car. We emptied the rice and the confetti. We wiped off the Vaseline and the shaving foam. We burst the balloons. We untied the tin cans from the back. We removed the bangers that were left over on the exhaust pipe. And we did a pretty thorough job of cleaning the car. Or so we thought. Well, we went on honeymoon for a week in Scotland, and throughout the week we did notice the occasional smell, which we put down to being next to the sea. And then on the way back from Scotland, we were starting married life in Devon, all the way back we began to smell this really strong smell coming from the air conditioning. Eventually, the car broke down. And we had to pull over to the hard shoulder and ring the breakdown company. And the breakdown man came. He was, of course, a very nice man. He lifted the bonnet. And there, slowly frying on the engine housing, were a couple of mackerel. And I tell you that story because I think if we don't understand this, if we don't have the confidence that Paul wants us to have, then I think many of us have a nagging doubt that there is something under the bonnet that will be exposed on the last day. What if I put my trust in the love of God? I stake my eternal destiny on it so that I will not be exposed when the tide goes out, but it turns out that God has not managed to pull it off rightly. What if he's not done it with perfect justice? So on the last day, there will be some accusation against God's character remaining, that this is all some kind of dodgy dealing, that something's been done that isn't quite right. Or what if my sin is so great that it has not been dealt with by God's love expressed in the cross of Christ? What if there is something in my past that is so huge, so stinking, like that mackerel festering away under our bonnet, that it will come back to haunt me in the end? You see how these two themes matter so much? The character of God. Can he pull this off rightly, justly? And the confidence of the Christian, can I face eternity with absolute confidence that my sin is dealt with? Well, that brings us to the second point, which is what has God done? And this is the central and crucial part of the sermon. Paul explains what God has done to demonstrate his perfect character and give us confidence in three crucial steps. Now, we've looked at these words already, but let's look at them uh, in the logic, in the order that Paul uh, puts them in. Firstly, justification. Have a look with me at verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Remember that righteousness and justice are connected to the same word in the original. So to be justified is to be declared right. To have a verdict given to you that you are innocent and free of guilt with no case to answer. So just put yourself in the courtroom. 
I don't know if you've ever been in a human court. I did jury service a few years ago. And it's a very serious business, even a human court, even for relatively trivial offences. There's something awe-inspiring about the judge with his wig giving a verdict. Now just imagine yourself in that courtroom and you've committed some crime for which you know you are guilty. You enter the court and you face the judge with trepidation because you know that for justice to be done, you must pay the penalty. But moments later, you emerge free of all accusation, having been declared innocent with nothing to pay, no case for answer. In fact, not only have you been declared innocent of that crime, not only of the crimes you've committed in the past, but of all the crimes you'll commit in the future, this is a verdict of innocence pronounced ahead of time for the last day. And the question we should be asking is, how is that possible? How can God be right to do this? How has he pulled it off justly? Well, that brings us to the second step. Paul says in verse 24 that he's brought about this verdict through what God has done in Jesus, which he calls redemption. Verse 24, they are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In other words, as you put yourself in that courtroom and you hear the verdict, Paul says something has happened that God has done through Jesus Christ to make that just. Well, you'll know that the word redemption was not a religious word at all, but was a way of describing a particular kind of financial transaction in which, as we saw in the video before, a price is paid to gain freedom. Now, my grandfather used to run a pawnbroker's shop. In case you're not familiar with these, the idea is that if you wanted some cash, you could pawn, that's P-A-W-N, if you're taking notes, something of value, which the shop keeps for an agreed amount of time, and which they get to sell unless you have the means to go and buy it back. And I can remember my grandfather telling stories of the sadness of people in financial trouble, handing over precious items to be pawned, a family heirloom, an engagement ring, a much-loved painting or musical instrument. But sometimes the stories would become happy stories. If a person's luck changed, they would be back in the shop and they would hand over money that they'd saved, as as well as some interest, of course, and they would buy the item back. And he would tell us stories of people walking out of the shop having redeemed their precious item with great joy. It's a redemption, being paid at a price for freedom. In fact, what Paul has in mind here is not the pawnbroker's shop, but the great story of the salvation of Israel at the time of the Exodus, when God himself bought Israel's freedom under Pharaoh and brought them safely into the promised land. Freedom bought at a price. And Paul says this is a picture of what God has done in Christ Jesus. He has paid something to buy guilty people their freedom forever. So you're standing in the courtroom. You hear the verdict of innocence. You know that God has done something called redemption in Jesus Christ. But that still doesn't answer the question, how is this just? How is it possible? How has God pulled it off? Well, we come to the center of the center, which is verse 25 in our third step, where Paul says God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. This sacrifice of atonement is the thing we must understand to make sure we are clear about the character of God and to make sure we leave this morning with confidence in it. Paul is saying that when Jesus gave up his life on the cross, that was the moment when everything was put right, when justice was done, when guilty people 
like you and me who have lived our lives doing it my way, are declared innocent justly. Now, this is where we need real clarity. And so I'm going to help us by offering three illustrations in quick succession, two of them from the Bible. The first illustration comes from that great salvation event of the Old Testament, the exodus from Egypt, which Paul calls the redemption of God. What did it take for God to redeem his people from Egypt back then? What was the price that was paid? Well, of course, if you know the story, and you may know the story from the Bible or Disney's Prince of Egypt, but if you know the basic story, you'll know that that redemption came through spectacular plagues that God sent of blood and frogs and gnats and flies and livestock and boils and hail and so on. But you may also know, and I can't remember whether it's the Prince of Egypt that brings this out or not, but it's certainly in the Bible, you'll also know that it was the final plague that mattered when the angel of death swept through the land and killed the firstborn of every house of the Egyptians. But you'll remember that God's people had to do one thing to avoid the plague of death. They had to sacrifice a lamb, which was a substitutionary sacrifice for their firstborn. And as a sign of their faith in that substitute, they had to smear the blood of the lamb on the door frames. So when the angel of death passed over their home, their firstborn lived to see another day. And so the price of redemption was not a price paid to Pharaoh to let them go. It was a price of the blood of the Lamb, an illustration of what it would take for God to deal with sin one day. The second illustration is also from the Old Testament, this time the high point of Israel's life, narrated in Leviticus 16, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, in which animals are substituted as sacrifices for people Again, as a way of imagining how God might one day justly deal with sin. And the day went like this. That on one day, every year, the high priest would slaughter a lamb, a bull and a goat. And he would take their blood into the Holy of Holies. The place where God was symbolically thought to dwell in the tabernacle. Where God met with his people, as it were. And the blood of the bull and the goat would be sprinkled there. And then the body of the bull and the goat would be burnt up to show the magnitude of what God would have to do to deal with the sin of his people. And that is why Paul now says in verse 25 that God presented Jesus Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. This is what he would have to become if God was going to redeem his people justly. Because the blood of bulls and goats and lambs cannot possibly work as a sacrifice for sin. They are just pictures. But when Jesus comes, he stands where these animals once stood as one final, perfect, climactic sacrifice, the end of all sacrifices. And as he dies on the cross, just as the lamb and the bull and the goat substituted one for many to take the righteous anger of God so Jesus stands in our place as a substitute. But how can one man deal with the sins of the whole world? How can that be just? Well, here's my third illustration. Joe has been leading this morning one of my colleagues and a friend Imagine if on the way home from the chapel this morning, Joe was brutally attacked by some thug, left on the road half dead, his wallet and phone stolen, and he wakes up in hospital with several broken bones. And imagine if I, because he's a friend, I go and visit him in hospital. I know we're not allowed to visit, just just imagine. And I go and look at him in his bed, with his arm and his legs all in plaster, bruises all over his face, traumatized by the mugging. 
And I say, cheer up, Joe. I bumped into your mugger, and I forgave them. What would Joe say to me? He would probably want to put me in the next bed by hitting me hard with his plastered arm. Because I have no right to forgive his mugger. That's neither love nor justice. That's just sentimentality. Only the offended party can forgive the perpetrator. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, yes, he is the representative man who stands in the place of each of us before God. But he is also the divine man sent from God by God to take upon himself the righteous anger of God for our sin so that as Jesus hung on the cross, God poured out his wrath on the sins of all humanity so that the full offence against God is justly experienced in humanity by the person of Jesus Christ so that we can be clothed in the love of God, expressed not just in words, but expressed through the cross of Christ. The innocent dies, so the guilty can go free, but justly. So God is right to call me right, even though I am wrong. Well, let's turn finally and briefly to the third point, which is what then must I do if this is true? I must not fudge, nor fear, but have faith. The fudge is to claim that we are okay with some kind of abstract, sentimental version of the love of God. That without the love of God being demonstrated in the atoning work of Jesus Christ on, the death, on his death on the cross, we will be okay. This is, for example, what American preacher Rob Bell teaches in his book, Love Wins, in which the idea is that, yes, God is holy, but God is more loving than holy. And his love is bigger than his holiness. And so his love one day just overwhelms his holiness in such the way that he does not need to deal with sin at all. Or you may have heard the quip by poet W.H. Alden. I like sinning. God likes forgiving. Clearly the world is fortunately set up. Well, this is incredibly dangerous and underestimates the seriousness of sin. Not only does it leave us exposed to God's justice on the last day, but it makes God out to be someone who is less just than he really is, who will not take seriously the chaos and cruelty that humanity has inflicted on each other over time. And it makes the cross of Christ unnecessary. Look again at what Paul says in verse 22. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice that word all, from the delivery driver to the consultant anaesthetist, both trusting only in Christ because both have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But on the other hand, while some underestimate their sin and make the cross unnecessary, others overestimate it and make the cross insufficient which leads to a lurking fear that their sins are too great. And I know that this is real for some people here this morning. As you look back on your past, yes, there are all the daily things that we ask God's forgiveness for, but there is that huge thing that God knows about, and perhaps few other people do. And you just have that sneaking fear perhaps a fear every day of your life that what God has done in Jesus Christ is not enough to cover your sin. You've cleaned the confetti from the car, you've unhitched the tin cans so that on the outside you look okay but you know that lurking under the bonnet 
some things you have done are so massive that you have a sneaking suspicion that you'll be exposed when the lid is lifted or when the tide goes out. You'll be seen to be swimming naked. Well, that fear can only be yours if there is any hint of unrightness in what God has done in Christ or any hint in insufficiency in his death. See, this is the point of this passage, to give us absolute confidence that God has not swept sin under the carpet, only to be revealed on the last day. There's no dodgy dealing. There's no skeletons in the closet, no mackerel under the bonnet, because Jesus himself, the sinless Son of God, fully man, fully God, has paid the price. He has fully absorbed the expression of God's anger for the whole of humanity once and for all. And therefore, if I trust in him, all my sins have gone. And I'm clothed in Christ, who took the full expression of God's wrath. Not a fudge, not fear. How therefore is this to be received by faith? Verse 22, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Faith is one of those Bible words that is often misunderstood. As if it's some kind of special quality that some people have and others don't. But in the Bible, faith and belief are the same word. In fact, faith and belief both mean trust. So what verse 22 literally says is, this righteousness from God comes through trust in Jesus Christ to all who trust. Paul is talking about the simple confidence to receive the great salvation that has come through the blood of Christ. No leap into the unknown, no special type of gullibility, no religious works required. It just requires us to have confidence in what God has done in Jesus. And I want to leave us with a picture of what this confidence looks like. And I'm doing this because I know how easy it is for us to flatter ourselves, to think that we can do something to give us more standing, more confidence with God. And this picture is an unflattering one. But it's what faith looks like. See, outside our house, we have a, a beech hedge, and every spring there's a family of blackbirds make a nest in the hedge. It's actually a risky place for them to nest because the cars go past and people walk past, and we occasionally peer in to see how the chicks are doing. And you know what blackbirds are like if you've ever watched them? The adults are incredibly active, from dawn to dusk, they are hunting worms, finding food, which they bring back to the nest, and they sort of regurgitate it in that rather disgusting way that birds do. But the picture I want you to think about is the baby blackbird. What does it do to receive the food? It just opens its mouth and receives what the parents have done. It's an unflattering picture but it's a picture of faith in the Bible. Because what God has done for us in Jesus, he has done rightly, justly, perfectly, fully, and finally. Nothing's been fudged, and there is nothing to fear. No skeletons in the closet, no mackerel under the bonnet, no pride, but no fear. And so our task is simply to receive. To receive what God has done for us and to spend eternity reveling in his love. Remember Warren Buffett's warning? It's only when the tide goes out that you realize who's been swimming naked. So let me ask you on that great and awesome day, 
when the tide goes out and what we have trusted in in this life will be exposed, will you be found naked? Or will you be clothed in the love of God expressed in the cross of Christ? Well, I'm going to pray a prayer that would be just right for someone who has heard God speak to them this morning. Even if you have never heard this before, or you've heard it hundreds of times before, and whoever you are, then can I encourage you not to walk away from this message until you are free from the terrible burden of sin. And you can have that freedom by praying this prayer. Let's pray it together. Dear God, I admit that I have tried to live life my own way, have not treated you as God, and I deserve your judgment. Please forgive me. Thank you that you have made it possible for me to be right with you through Jesus' death on the cross, which he died instead of me. Please help me from now on to put my trust in Jesus and to live with him as my Saviour and King. Amen.